Hello again. This video is an undergraduate lecture about orthodontic treatment of dental spacing and hypodontia. Generalized spacing is not common and is due to either hypodontia or small teeth in well-developed arches. Orthodontic management of generalized spacing is frequently difficult as there is usually a tendency for the spaces to reopen unless a permanent retainer is done. In milder cases, it may be wiser to encourage the patient to accept the spacing and just prevent orthodontic treatment altogether. Or if the teeth are narrower than average, acid edge composite additions or porcelain veneers can be used to widen them and thus improve aesthetics. Spaces can be closed by retracting protruded anterior teeth or by mesializing the posterior teeth. In severe cases of hypodontia, a combined orthodontic restorative approach can be used in which the orthodontics would collect the spaces in one place and the restorative part would replace the missing teeth. Now concerning localized spacing. It may be due to hypodontia or loss of a tooth as a result of uh, extraction or trauma. This problem is most noticeable if an upper incisor is missing. That's because of the asymmetry generated, which is very catchy to the eye. Upper central incisors are rarely congenitally absent. They can be lost as a result of trauma. Or occasionally, their extraction may be indicated because of severe cases of dilaceration like this impacted dilacerated tooth. Lost central incisors should be replaced to prevent adjacent teeth from drifting into the extraction site as this midline shift is going to complicate later treatment. Autotransplantation is the surgical repositioning of a tooth into a surgically created socket within the same patient. It is successful to transplant open apex premolars from a crowded arch into the socket of an evolved central incisor. And this is a case where these premolars have been autotransplanted instead of the upper central incisors, and at later age they're going to be reshaped to resemble central incisors. Hypodontia, which is a congenitally absence of one or more teeth in Caucasian populations, is at around 3.5 to 6.5 percent. This is excluding third molars, as one or third one or more third molars is missing in about 25 to 35 percent of the population. This, of course, is followed by second premolars at 3 percent and upper lateral incisors at 2 percent. These all could be bilateral or unilateral. Now, for treatment of missing upper lateral incisors, whatever the reason of absence of lateral incisors, there are two treatment options. Closure of the space by camouflaging the canines, grinding the cusps, and flattening the label surfaces and adding composite when needed, or opening the space and placement of a fixed or a removable prosthesis. The choice of a particular patient will depend on a number of factors. Firstly, the skeletal relationship. Space closure by incisor retraction may be preferred in class 2 division 1 cases as it will aid in overjet reduction, but this is unfavorable in class 3 malocclusion where opening the space is indicated as it will push the upper incisors forward and correct the overjet. The presence of crowding and spacing is also important as in when there is crowding, the space can be utilized to relieve the, the crowding and in generalized spacing conditions, you can collect the spaces by opening the space for a later prosthesis. The color and form of the adjacent teeth is also important, meaning the canines and the central incisors as if the permanent canines are much darker than the incisors, 
and are pointed in shape, modification of them to resemble lateral incisors will be more difficult, and this is something to be noted. Also, if the lateral incisors are to be brought forward to replace a missing central incisor, then an aesthetically pleasing result will only be possible if the lateral incisor is fairly large and it has a wide gingival area. The inclination of the teeth, and mainly the canines, is also of importance as retracting mesially inclined canines and opening the space is easier and protracting distally inclined canines and closing, closing the space is easier. Regarding the buccal segment, if the buccal segment relationship is class 1, then protracting the molars to close the space will convert the class 1 molar relationship into a class 2 molar relationship and therefore it may be advisable to keep the space rather than protract the molars to close it. The patient's wishes and ability to cooperate with the complicated treatment is also important as some patients have a definitive idea about whether they are willing to proceed with appliance treatment and whether they wish to have space closed or open for prosthetic replacement. And finally, the long-term maintenance and replacement of the prosthesis costs. It varies between reshaping of the teeth or maintenance for a prosthesis. To sum it all up, closing of the spaces is indicated in Class 2 Division 1 malocclusion, crowding dentition, good form and color of the canines, distally inclined canines, non-Class 1 molar relationship, patient does not want a prosthesis straight replacement, patient does not want any long-term maintenance or replacement costs, whereas opening the space is indicated in class 3 malocclusion, spaces, space dentition, dark colored or pointed canines, mesially inclined canines, class 1 molar relationship, patient accepts a prosthetic replacement, and patient accepts long-term maintenance and replacement costs. Now concerning space closure. Carried out by either molar protraction or incisor retraction or conservative closure of the space. Now for molar protraction, early extraction of any deciduous teeth which do not have any permanent teeth after them allows forward movement of the first permanent molars, but fixed appliances are generally required to complete the alignment and correct the axial inclines. Tads can be used to uh, protract these molars and they will help greatly in the anchorage and at the same time you should take care of the mesial, the mesial tilting of these molars as they move forward and this can be controlled by good biomechanics with the fixed appliance. Incisor retraction is useful where there is increased overjet. Conservative closure of the space when it is selected then you'll need to grind the canines labially, lingually, grind the cusps and reduce the interproximal width of these canines to resemble the laterals. Also the addition of acid etch and composite to resemble the canines. This all should be done preferably before placing the brackets on the, for orthodontic treatment as they would <coughs> make the uh, end result much easier. Although definitive restorations by crowns and veneers are best delayed until the treatment is complete. Placement of a bonded lingual retainer is also advisable. Whereas when you're choosing space, a clinical decision must be made when you get a child and he has missing lateral incisors and there is the retained B. Should you extract the B and allow the canine to erupt forward, or should you leave the B in place and allow the canine to erupt normally, and when he becomes an adult, then you extract the B. 
Now, since the removal of the bee will encourage the canine to move forward and hence bring bone with it, then at a later age when the patient is almost an adult, you can retract the canine backward and then put an implant. This increased bone that comes with the eruption of the canine more measly will be greatly welcome when the time comes to insert the implants. However, when we want to open spaces, a fixed appliance is always required to retract these canines backward. After that, you can place a cemented tooth or a bonded tooth to replace the missing lateral incisor. Whenever space is open for bridge work, it's important to retain with a partial denture for at least three to six months, particularly if an adhesive acid etch retainer bridge is to be used, as these bridges, if placed immediately the, after the completion of the opening of the space, then uh, there'll be a greater incidence of failure and this is because of the teeth being mobile and they can chip off the bridge. If your choice is for implants, then these require the roots to be parallel. And since orthodontically repositioning the roots by spreading them away, these may relapse and they would come and hit on the implant and causing its failure. That's why if implants are to be placed, long-term retention needs to be carried out after orthodontic treatment and before the placement of the implants. And finally, regarding median diastema. As a median diastema tends to reduce or close with the eruption of the canines, management can be subdivided as follows, either before the eruption of the permanent canines or after eruption of the permanent canines. Now for before eruption of the permanent canines, intervention is only necessary if the diastema is greater than three millimeters in width and there's lack of space for the eruption of the lateral incisors. However, care should be taken to prevent the resorption of the roots by hitting on the unerupted canine crowns. Whereas in cases after eruption of the permanent canines, space closure is usually straightforward. Fixed appliances are required to achieve and upright the incisors after space closure. Prolonged retention is usually necessary as diastema exhibits a greater tendency to reopen, especially if there's a familial tendency, the upper arch was spaced or the initial diastema was greater than two millimeters. Alternatively, if the diastema is small, then composite buildups or a veneer can be done to prevent orthodontic treatment. A U or V-shaped radiographic appearance of the interproximal bone between the maxillary central incisor is a diagnostic key of the persistent middle, midline diastema. The patient should be informed before orthodontic treatment of the need for long-term retention with bonding of the central incisors lingually after treatment to prevent returning of the maxillary midline diastema. If it is thought that the frenum is a contributory factor, then phrenectomy should be considered. Options differ as to whether this should be done before treatment, during space closure, or after completion of the closure of the space. Generally, surgical removal of the maxillary labial sphrenum should be delayed until after orthodontic treatment, unless the tissue pre prevents the space closure or becomes painful and traumatic. Removal may be indicated after treatment to change irreversible hyperplastic tissue to normal gingival form and to enhance post-treatment stability.
I hope you found this lecture interesting. I have several other lectures in the YouTube channel, and I've arranged them into playlists as orthodontic biomechanics, undergraduate orthodontics, postgraduate orthodontics, and TAD workshops. And I hope you can go through them and see anyone which is of interest. If you have any If you found, you found this video, video useful, interesting, please, please give it a thumbs like up, it, share it with friends, with friends, and you, you can, can subscribe to the channel from here. You can press the bell so icon you so that it notifies you whenever we videos. upload a new video. This is a, full this is a playlist the for the whole biomechanics uh, lectures, and this, and this is the latest biomechanical video. lecture that uh, has video. been uploaded recently. Thank you for listening.